Welcome to this video about decision trees for classification. In this video we learn how to interpret a decision tree and how to create a decision tree based on the Gini index. We will also discuss how to prune a tree. Suppose that we have the following decision tree to determine if someone has fever or hypothermia based on the person's body temperature in Celsius. This tree tells us that if a person has a body temperature that is greater than 38, the person is classified as having fever. If the person has a body temperature that is less than or equal to 38, but greater or equal to 35, which means that the person's body temperature is between 35 and 38. The person has neither hypothermia nor fever. If the body temperature is below 35, the person is classified as having hypothermia because the body temperature is too low. A classification tree consists of nodes, which represent a choice between alternatives based on the value of the measured variable. The node at the top of the tree is called the root node. Leaf nodes represent the decision. The arrows are called branches or edges. We'll now have a look at the larger fictive decision tree that could be used to determine if a biopsy of the prostate is necessary to determine if a person has prostate cancer or not. The following decision tree can be used for prostate cancer screening of older men. The aim is to determine if the person should undergo a biopsy of the prostate or not. Such a biopsy can then be used to detect tumor cells. If the person is in the age between 50 and 60, and has a prostate-specific antigen level in the blood that is less than 3 nanogram per mil. We expect that the person does not have prostate cancer and no further testing is done. However, if the PSA level is equal to or greater than 3, an MRI scan of the prostate is done, which generates a score from 1 to 5. A score less than 3 indicates that it is unlikely that the person has prostate cancer. If a person has a score less than 3, no biopsy is therefore taken from the prostate. In comparison, if the MRI score is equal to or greater than 3, it is quite likely that the person has prostate cancer. The person should therefore undergo a biopsy to confirm this. For men that are older than 60 years of age, the cutoff value for the PSA level is a bit higher because the PSA level tends to increase during aging. Older men should therefore have a PSA level that is greater than 4 and an MRI score of 3 or more before a biopsy is recommended. Note that the variables H and PSA are on a numerical scale, whereas the variable MRI has an ordinal scale. Decision trees work just fine with variables on both numeric and categorical scales. We can even have a variable on a numeric scale. This is one advantage with decision trees, because most other classification methods do not work well with categorical variables. We'll now learn how to construct a decision tree. To construct a decision tree, we need some training data where we know the class of each observation. Let's say that we like to create a decision tree that can predict if a man has prostate cancer or not based on a PSA test. These four individuals are known to be healthy. The numbers inside the circles show the PSA level in the blood of these four individuals. And these are five individuals that are known to have prostate cancer. Note that the PSA level is a bit higher in these patients compared to the healthy controls. We first begin to sort individuals based on their PSA concentrations. Next, we should find a good cutoff value that separates the two groups. However, where should we set the cutoff value to predict if someone has prostate cancer or not? Maybe a cutoff value at 2.9, or at 3.3, or at 3.75. One way to determine the cutoff value is to use the so-called Gini index, which is a measure of impurity. Since we want as pure groups as possible, we should select the split the results in as low Gini index as possible. 
If we would split the data here, we should set the cutoff value to 2.6 because that is the mean value of the two closest data points for this split. A cutoff of 2.6 would split the data into these two groups. The Gini index is calculated like this, where P is the proportion of each class. Since we have two classes in this example, prostate cancer and healthy, we should sum the squared proportion of these two classes. Let's calculate the Gini index of the following subgroup. Two out of the seven individuals in this subgroup are healthy individuals, whereas five out of the seven individuals are patients with prostate cancer. This gives us a Gini index of about 0 0.41. If we do the corresponding calculations for this subgroup, we see that the Gini index is equal to zero, which means that we have 100% purity or 0% impurity. Then we calculate the weighted average of these two Gini indexes. Since this subgroup consists of two data points, we multiply the Gini index by 2 over 9, since we have 9 data points in total for this split. And since this subgroup consists of 7 data points, we multiply the Gini index by 7 over 9. By using a cutoff value of 2.6, the Gini index is equal to about 0 0.32. Now, let's use a cutoff value of 2.9. This results in high purity because the Gini index has been reduced to 0 0.19. A cutoff value of 3.3 .3 results in a Gini index of 0 0.34, and a cutoff value of 3.75 results in a Gini index of 0 0.18, and so forth. After we have calculated the Gini index for all possible splits, we select the split that results in the lowest Gini index, which is the one that generates the purest groups. This is the reason why we should select a cutoff value of 3.75 for this dataset. If we have two or more variables, one usually starts with a variable that generates the lowest Gini index unless there is a logical order for how the variables should be measured. If we would use the following cutoff value, we would predict that these individuals do not have prostate cancer because the majority of these observations in this leaf node are healthy individuals, whereas these individuals are predicted to have prostate cancer. Since we know, based on the training data, that these individuals are actually healthy, and that these actually have prostate cancer, we know that we have four true negative results, one false negative, and four true positives. We can therefore calculate the accuracy of this tree based on the training data by dividing the number of true negatives and positives by the total number of observations we have. We see that the accuracy of the classifier based on this example data is about 89%. Note that we can continue to grow the tree to get an even better prediction. If we let the tree grow, the tree will always perfectly predict the training data and we will always get an accuracy of 100%. By letting the tree grow too much, we will encounter something that is called overfitting. To understand the concept of overfitting, let's say that we also have data on the body weights in kilos of the 9 individuals. Think about this for a second. Do you think that it would be possible to predict if someone has prostate cancer based on his body weight? That seems impossible, right? However, a decision tree would have no problem in dividing the groups with 100% purity. By using the following cutoff values, the decision tree would create 5 subgroups with 100% purity. These two persons will be correctly predicted to have prostate cancer because their weights are less than 57.5 kilos. These two persons will be correctly classified as being healthy, and these two will also be correctly predicted, and so forth. This seems too good to be true. 
Is this tree really useful? What has happened is that we have encountered overfitting, which is highly problematic when we use decision trees. Let's say that we would collect a new data set with five individuals who have prostate cancer and four healthy individuals. Since this is a new sample, we expect that the body weights are different from our previous sample. If we would use the decision tree that we created earlier to classify the new data set, we see that the following healthy individuals will be incorrectly classified as having prostate cancer and that these individuals with prostate cancer will be incorrectly classified as being healthy. These individuals happen to be correctly predicted due to chance. When the tree has many leaf nodes relative to the sample size, this indicates that the model has been overfitted, which means that we have built a perfect model on the training data. The following decision tree would be completely useless if you apply it on new individuals. To know how well a decision tree would perform on new data, we have to use some sort of validation technique that we have discussed in a previous video. One way to overcome the problem with overfitting is to prune the tree. There are a number of different methods for pruning a tree. To show how pruning works, we'll use the same data on the PSA concentration of four healthy individuals and five patients with prostate cancer. If you let the tree grow so that it perfectly separates the groups in the training data, the tree will look like this. We see that all nine individuals are correctly predicted by this tree. To prune this tree, we can for example specify that the minimum number of observations must be equal to six to allow a split. The first node was based on all nine data points. Whereas the second node classified only five data points which is less than our treasured value of 6. The tree would therefore stop growing here, so that the tree only consists of one root node. Although this tree consists of only one node, it still correctly predicts 8 out of the 9 observations. Another strategy would be to prune the tree based on some sort of validation method. We therefore need a validation dataset that has not been involved to create the tree. For example, let's say that we have collected four new healthy individuals and four new patients with prostate cancer. We then analyze how well the tree would classify the validation data set based on only one node. In this example, a tree would make seven correct predictions out of the eight possible. If we would add a second node of the tree that was proposed based on the training data, and decide that this leaf node should be associated with prostate cancer. This observation will now be incorrectly predicted. The accuracy would therefore be reduced to 75%. Adding a third node will now correctly predict this observation. However, a tree with three nodes has the same accuracy as a tree with only one node. If the accuracy does not increase or only increase marginally, it might be a good idea to prune the tree from the node where the tree does not improve the prediction of the validation dataset. In this case, a tree with more than one node does not improve the accuracy. In other words, a larger tree does not reduce the error, which means that we should select a tree with only one node in this case. This was the end of this lecture about decision trees. In the next lecture, we have a look at random forests which are based on many decision trees but do not involve any problems with overfitting.